Welcome to Webinar 6, where we will hear a presentation by Mia Karlsson and Marcus Smith from the Swedish National Heritage Board. Mia is Operations Developer, working with the Management and Development of Korsomsök, or SOC, the Swedish aggregator for Open Cultural Heritage Data. Marcus Smith is also Operations Developer, working with SOC, as well as linked open data, digital fieldwork documentation, and the digitization of runic inscriptions. Marcus and Mia will tell us about their experiences aggregating national collections metadata. We are so happy to be here today and to have the opportunity to present Korsamsök or SOC in English to you and also to show some of the amazing content you can find access through this resource. I will start with a brief background uh, and also give you a glimpse on what you can find in SOC. Uh, and my colleague Marcus will take over to tell you how you can access all this data. So what is SOC? Um, in 2008, the Swedish National Heritage Board was given an assignment from the government that involved developing and managing an infrastructure for digital heritage data in Sweden. The development took place in collaboration with a number of cultural heritage institutions and today SOC is a central part of the National Heritage Board's, Board's mission to promote uh, development and collaboration in the cultural heritage sector. SOC is a web service that harvests metadata from the databases of cultural heritage institutions in Sweden, indexes and links the data and then publish it, allowing third parties to build on and use the data via web API. We work together with mainly museums and archives at the moment, but we are more than happy to include libraries, universities and other organizations working with heritage data. The main requirements to be a partner to SOC is that the organization has a relatively stable management and that they have published the, the, their data publicly online. It is free of charge to become a partner to SOC. But why do we do this? We want it to be easier for more people to access and take advantage of all the cultural heritage information that is collected in a wide range of databases around Sweden. We want to make it easier for people to find and use digital heritage cultural heritage in the work, in learning and for pleasure and through this uh, contrib contributes to a transparent, educated and creative society. As mentioned before, the institution must have published the data online and the data must be accessible, that is not behind a login or locked behind a payment wall. It is always the institution that decide what data they want to open up for, to SOC. Only metadata is harvested through an OII PMH protocol. All images, audio files and scanned documents are only harvested as links. In principle, no metadata is added when harvesting. The only thing that is automatically added is some technical metadata such as the date the first harvest of the object was made. In addition, we also host a service to store links between objects in SOC and between objects and online resources, such as articles on Wikipedia or bibliographic information at the National Library. SOC has today 74 partners. The majority are museums, as you can see, but there are also archives, associations and municipalities. We are constantly working to get more partners and at present we have an active contact with at least five other institutions. SOC consists of data, a lot of data. Currently you can find 8.2 million objects in SOC, of which more than half has an image and about 20% has a geolocation. The content in SOC consists of a variety of different object types. You can find scanned books, maps and drawings, audio and video, as well as historical events, stories and much more. You can reach the content in SOC in several different ways. First and foremost, there is the SOC API, 
which is completely open and free to use. Marcus will tell you a bit more about this. But for those who are interested, there is a good guide on our website on how to easily start working with API. If you are more interested in looking at the content in SOC, there is the search portal Kringla. It shows quite straightforwardly how the data looks like, and you can get a good overview of the objects. Kringla is a completely open service where, where we have over 1,000 unique visitors per day. Part of the content in SOC are delivered to Eripiana, which I will tell you more about shortly. Eripiana also has an API and a search portal that are open and free to use. And we are constantly working to reach out to new target groups. Among other things, we have started a campaign on Instagram where we follow the children's book character Nils Holgesson around the Swedish provinces once again. And we are posting content on Pinterest to reach new audiences. On this slide, you can see some different representation of data in SOC. First of all, you have the digital object, in this case, a photo of a dog. Next, you see the metadata from the interface of Kringle. And last, there is the RDF representation of the same objects. In order to deliver data to SOC, the institution needs to map their data model to SOC's data model. The mandatory elements are very few because we want a low threshold for the institutions to contribute data. However, this, this makes the data in SOC quite mixed concerning quality and contents. Some object has very rich metadata with descriptive and curated text, as well as a number of links to other objects or resources online. And other data, well, it contains very few metadata. What is common to almost all data is that it is created initially and primarily for the institution's own collection management. This means that some metadata can be difficult to understand, such as different classifications or identifiers. All metadata in SOC is labeled CC0. This is a requirement for the infrastructure to work. However, the digital objects themselves may have different write statements. SOC has a write statements model that is based on established licenses and labels. The write statements allowed range from fully open, such as public domain and CC BY, to full copyright. It is always the institution that is responsible for correct labeling. All data must be labeled with one of these statements in the model. But there is still some really old data that hasn't been updated, updated for a long time that might lack write statements. If you come across one of these objects and you want to use it, please contact the institution responsible. As I mentioned before, some of the content in SOC is visible in Europeana. This is possible since SOC is an aggregator to Eripiana and makes 3.1 million objects available from our partners. Eripiana is in some way like SOC, but at an European level, and their mission is to empower cultural heritage institutions to share their collections with the world. Over 58 million cultural heritage items from around 4,000 institutions across Europe are available online through Europeana collections. SOC were a part of Europeana almost from the very beginning as a pilot, but the first real data from us were published online in 2010. Since then, a lot of Swedish institutions have made the data accessible through Europeana. Today, over 50 institutions deliver the data to Europeana through SOC, and they are reaching a very wide international public by this. SOC are today the largest national aggregator to Europeana. The fantastic thing about Europeana is that you can find objects and other content from all over the world in one place. Even if you're working on a Swedish topic, you might find brilliant content from maybe a French or a Polish institution. Before I hand over to Marcus, 
I would like to pinpoint some issues working with data from collection management systems and with aggregated data. You might feel overwhelmed by the large amount of data, but it is important to keep some things in mind when using this data in your research. All data is collected for a reason, and probably not the same reason you have when you are looking at the data. Most of the content in SOC comes from collection management systems. A lot of the metadata is recorded for internal use, but the institution are kindly sharing it with us all. The data has been collected, recorded, structured and digitized during a long period. Focus and policies may have shifted and data is sometimes hard to compare over time. Images digitized a long time ago will probably have very low resolution. But if you contact the institution, they might help you to re-digitize the objects you need. The mapping between different data models and protocols can sometimes have flaws. Europeana is enriching metadata, as we heard before today, which in many ways are good. But this is mostly an automatic process and the enrichment sometimes fails. If you compare the data in Europeana and SOC with the institution's own database, you might find differences. This could be because of the data is not updated due to different harvesting processes. The data is not fitting the data model in the aggregated structure or maybe that the institution have simply missed out to deliver some of the elements in their mapping. And last, do not forget that it takes time and resources to digitize content and work on metadata in the collection systems. Remember that your ideas, even though they are really, really great, might not be the highest priority in the heritage institution. So include the museums, archives, libraries and associations from the very beginning of your research. This will, this will make it so much easier for you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Uh, so we'll move on to markets now. Well, thank you very much, Mia. And thank you also and Anna for having us here. My name is Marcus Smith. I'm an operations officer at the Swedish National Heritage Board and as I was introduced I work with the SOC metadata aggregator for linked data and also with uh, various other projects including digitization of archaeological fieldwork data and unique inscriptions. Um, so Mia has given you an introduction to the, the SOC platform and a little bit about Klingler and what I'd like to do now is go into a bit more detail about how um, that data can be of use to researchers, how researchers can access that data, and a little bit about uh, things that we're looking at to enrich the metadata and things that our um, cultural heritage institutions that provide data can do to also improve the metadata quality. So as Mia has said, SOC is a, a, a metadata aggregator for heritage data. Um, it's the Swedish National Aggregator for Europeana, and we publish that data both via an API and as linked open data on the scientific web. The index contains 8.2 million items, including monuments and sites, archaeological, archaeological interest, uh, historic buildings and churches, various artifacts from the 70 plus museums that contribute data to us from their collections, photographs, which is possibly our, our biggest uh, uh, treasure in, in the SOC index. Uh, we have Vikings, who doesn't like Vikings? We have taxidermied horses, all of these things that could be of interest to researchers in different fields within the heritage sector. Uh, and we have far more than just photographs and, and artifacts. We have uh, posts about audio, video, people, events, documents, all kinds of stuff. The main human accessible interface to the SOC index is the, the Klingler portal and it's very easy to search there and to get a, a, an overview of what kind of data exists in the index. But what I'd like to talk a bit more about now is what that data looks like behind the scenes and how it, you can actually access that data as a researcher. So the SOC platform is built on uh, linked open data 
which is uh, one of the, the fundaments of uh, what we call the semantic web. Uh, and it builds on this kind of uh, data model that is both composed of links, but also op uh, open licenses. So first I'm going to talk a bit about the, the open side of linked open data, and then I'll talk a bit about the, the linked side. So as Mia mentioned, uh, all of the metadata in the SOC index is openly licensed it's CC0. And then we all, all also require that uh, all rich records, that is records that contain images or audio or documents, uh, mark the rights statements, the, the licenses that are applicable to those uh, media. And for the majority of cases, that means a Creative Commons license. In most cases, that means CC BY, CC0, or public domain, particularly for the older objects. And then uh, a further 41% uh, of the, the rich objects also use uh, other CC licenses, Creative Commons licenses, such as uh, non-commercial or, or uh, no derivatives, share alike, those kinds of things, which are slightly more restrictive. But the majority of the data there is uh, openly licensed in one way or another. Uh, we do allow uh, copyrighted material, but that's still in the minority for the time being. So that's kind of the open side. And then the linked side of linked open data is uh, coming back to this idea of the semantic web. A semantic web is, is really just like the, the web that you're familiar with, that you surf, uh, search through Google. It's an interconnected network of, of documents, except in this case, it's not documents that are linked together. It's, uh, it's data that's linked together. And the links themselves are not just connections that say this piece of data is connected in some way to this other piece of data, but also that it describes the nature of that relationship. Um, the data model that's used for the semantic web is called RDF, and it is composed of these uh, very simple statements that, uh, that uh, contain three separate sections, the subject, predicate, and object. It's like a, a simple sentence. Uh, this picture depicts this object. And we represent these using URIs, as if it's something on the web. And this is how the, the, the semantic web data model is built, and this is what the, what the SOC index is built, up and built upon. Um, when we talk about these semantic links, it, it, it describes how different objects, how different posts in the SOC index and in, in other platforms are related to, together. So for example, you might have a link between a photograph and the, the artifact that that photograph depicts. You might have uh, a document that is linked to the monument that describes. Um, in SOC we have uh, a number of links between historical personages, people, and the artifacts and objects that they owned or that they used, uh, the events that they were present at. We have contextual relationships, sometimes there are hierarchies within, within objects or collections, so you might for example have um, uh, monuments that are comprised of smaller monuments, or you might have um, records that are part of larger records, a larger collection, for example. And we also have identities. So uh, this is another fundamental part of the, the, the linked data model that you can describe uh, two records that describe the same thing. So two, two different museums might each have a post about uh, a particular king. And so it's important that we say, these two things are describing the same person. <clears throat> Within the SOC index, we, we don't just link between uh, objects that are in the index, but also uh, out to external resources. So um, in the nature of the, the open web, we have uh, we allow links to external resources. We have links to Wikipedia articles, to images of Wikimedia, to entries of Wikidata. Uh, we encourage the use of shared vocabularies, for example, from to and of, uh, identities at BIAF, uh, the use of Getty AAT thesauri, for example. Uh, we have uh, links between objects and uh, books and articles at the Swedish National Library that describe them, for example, or in the case of authors that were written by them. Uh, and then this is expanded upon as we deliver data uh, upstream to Europeana. The data in SOC is available via an open API that we have. Uh, which allows you to search across all of the different data sets that we harvest using a variety of different search parameters. Um, as I said, we use URIs as identifiers, as permanent identifiers, and you can get the data back from the API 
either by dereferencing those URIs or uh, through the search query and you get data back for, as a response to your query. Um, the main data format that we use is, is RDF, uh, but you can, you can also get data uh, out as just plain XML or as JSON-LD, which is a, a JSON serialization of RDF linked data. Um, and we also have uh, something parallel to the SOC index, which we call our UV, UGC hub, which is a hub for uh, user generated content. I'll come on to that later. Querying the web API for, to get access to data in, in SOC to, to perform searches across these data sets is, is fairly simple. Um, there are a couple of example queries up on the screen now. Uh, the first one is just a simple search query. You're looking for um, any uh, records that contain the text runestone and are of type photograph. So you're looking here, here for all photographs that contain anywhere in their metadata the string runestone. The second one is uh, to find links between objects. Uh, get relations is to, to find uh, links between different uh, records. Um, and in this case, we're looking for links that either are pointing to or are pointing from uh, a particular uh, monument, which we uh, provide the ID for. And all of the API documentation is available on our website. Um, it's <coughs> sometimes a little bit idiosyncratic, but it's fairly straightforward by and large. Um, because we have this open data and this open API, SOC uh, lends itself very well to being used as a development platform. So because you can get back machine readable data, you can build all kinds of interesting things on it. So we have this uh, public interface cleaner that the National Heritage Board has produced. But there are also a variety of different mobile apps that have been produced, built on SOC by third parties. Uh, various different people have combined the data in SOC with other data sets to produce web-based mashups. Um, and we even have uh, some museums that provide data to SOC and then use the SOC platform, not their own platforms, but use the SOC platform as uh, an interface to their own data sets, which may seem a bit counterintuitive. They are the ones who are managing and, and, uh, and curating this data. Why would they build on a third party platform to get data back? But the thing is, when you provide your data to SOC, other institutions that have similar data and related data may well be providing links to, to your records. So when your data is indexed by SOC, the chances are good that you will actually be able to get more out of it when you bring it back than the data that you provide, because there will be these incoming links from other institutions. Also, if you're a, a heritage organization, your collection management system may not provide uh, an application interface, a programming interface, um, that provides you with the uh, query functionality or the flexibility that you need to be able to build web interfaces. And that is something that the SOC API does provide. I mentioned before that we have this UGC hub, a hub for user-generated content. It sits alongside the SOC index, and, but is separate from it. And it effectively allows uh, third-party users, um, both users of Klingla and also via an API, to provide to enrich, to create new links between objects and also links from objects in the SOC index out to external parties. So uh, one way to do that is to, to go through the Klingla interface to create an account, log in, and then link between objects or out to external uh, objects using that interface. But there is also uh, a separate API for the UGC hub, both um, a, a write API that lets you automatically uh, create links um, programmatically, but also one that allows you to query for uh, links that other people have created. So we, we keep uh, the data that's provided by the heritage organizations in SOC separate from third-party created links that live in the user-generated content hub. Um, the vast majority of those links that we have at the moment uh, are created automatically, programmatically via that API. A lot of them are the same as links that link to corresponding uh, records in Wikidata, in Europeana, and in other places. Um, we have a lot of media links to Wikimedia Commons uh, and a lot of uh, bibliographic links to the Swedish National Library, who have a, a wonderful data service that provides bibliographic information. Um, 
during the course of the, our work with SOC, we've been looking at various new ways to to visualize the data in, in, in innovative ways, to explore the data in maybe uh, unconventional ways, and to enrich the data that we have in the index that, we, that we're provided with. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few of those quickly now, just to give a few examples. Um, the first one here is uh, how we can visualize or get a sort of an overview of the kind of data that we have in, in SOC. Um, what kind of uh, dating periods we're looking at, what kind of uh, keywords, subjects, areas, um, what kind of what kind of records they are, photographs, documents, uh, monuments, uh, different ways to explore this. This is available on, our, on the National Heritage Board's GitHub. Um, it just allows you to sort of do uh, keyword-based searches and, and uh, just sort of browse and explore the kinds of data that we have in the index to get an overview. Um, this is a, another one that's uh, a sort of a, a generous user interface based around browsing the data through, um, through primary color. So there's no search interface here. All you can do is um, uh, filter the, the records that are displayed based on the col primary colors that they use and the keywords that they're tagged with. And it sort of provides a, a different way in to what can otherwise be a large and daunting data set. All of these are just pilot projects that we've been looking at as potential ways forward. Another application that we uh, looked at last year was this Faces of Sweden, which provides a sort of a, a timeline using portraits from the from Nordisk Museet, from the Nordic Museum. Again, it's just a, a, a non-search based way to to browse the records that we have in a, in a sort of pleasing, uh, accessible manner. When it comes to uh, metadata enrichments, as Mia has said, we don't actually in SOC change or alter the data that we're provided with by uh, our data providers. So um, in terms of data enrichment, we either rely on the UGC hub, which is separate from the data that we're provided with, or um, in helping the uh, heritage organizations that provide us with data to enrich uh, the records at source. And one of the pilot projects that we had last year uh, was actually one that uh, Albin was leading, who presented earlier, um, and that was uh, how, to, um, how to get metadata enrichments that had been created by third parties back to those source organizations. So there were a bunch of heritage organizations that have uh, uploaded images, for example, and other media to Wikimedia Commons. And then the Wikimedia community has enriched that data and, and um, crowdsourced uh, new information. And the project was looking at, well, how can heritage organizations then get back that uh, third party enriched data so that they can apply it within their own collections? Another thing, another way we've been looking at uh, enriching data is also something that Alvin brought up in his previous presentation, namely um, how to uh, use machine learning and artificial intelligence to provide keyword metadata to uh, objects which or records which are often um, rather poor in their metadata. Um, and so we did a, a pilot project with images with very little markup, very few keywords. And uh, we had some success using, uh, in this particular case, Google's image API to try to recognize keywords and features. Um, so not a specialized system in any way, just the generic Google keyword uh, AI uh, image recognition system. But it actually provided a fairly good uh, metadata enrichment for the pilot project. All of these uh, pilot projects uh, are linked here. You can, you can view the results on our GitHub. Um, speaking specifically to researchers now, uh, what can you get out of SOC? How can you use the data? First thing I would say is to make the most of the data in, that we have in SOC. We have, you know, these 70 plus institutions that are all providing data where uh, we have this API that allows you to search across these multiple data sets. Um, the data is provided in a machine readable way. And because we have these links between records, it means that you have context for the for the records that you're looking at. They're not just sitting there in isolation, They're, they exist within a, 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 a broader whole. Um, 
as Mia has said, the, roughly 25% of our records also contain uh, coordinate data, which means that you can create distribution maps. And because of the open license model that we use, uh, the data metadata is completely free for reuse with no strings attached. Um, because we also leverage the, the power of uh, uh, semantic web and mixed open data model, the, the model that SOC uses is a very flexible and quite rich, a very expressive data model, um, which means that you can actually get a lot out of it. And because it's a, an, a linked data platform and we use URIs as our identifiers, that means that it's completely open for third parties to enrich, that, to enrich records either locally or by publishing their own statements about records. The whole, whole idea of linked data is that, that these URIs should be um, reused by, other, by third parties and by, by anybody really to, to create their own statements about the same things. As long as you're making statements about the same uh, URI, then uh, it, it becomes part of that semantic web. So you can do this either by publishing your own data using our URIs or by tagging things, creating extra links through the UGC hub. Um, as Mia mentioned, sometimes there are differences between the data that you see in Europeana contra the data that you see in SOC and the data that you might find at the source. If in doubt, one of the key aspects of SOC is that we always link back to the source institution. So if something looks weird or if you're not sure about something, there's always a link back to the uh, record at the providing institution and you can always get in touch with them if necessary. But um, the data in SOC is not perfect. There are a number of uh, known issues, caveat emptor. Firstly, uh, as Mia has mentioned, the data quality varies greatly between the providers that, uh, that publish data via SOC. Some records are extremely rich and well linked with good metadata and, uh, and lots of uh, shared vocabularies. Others just have a few keywords and sometimes will lack a title. So there's a great variety in the quality of data that we, that we have. Um, although we uh, promote the use of shared vocabularies, uh, in practice, they're still uh, fairly used fairly rarely in practice. Um, and uh, even more so for, for linked data authorities. Even when uh, shared vocabularies are used, they're often used just as, uh, as keyword strings rather than as uh, references to, to uh, public vocabularies or ontologies that are linked data. The, the richness and the depth of the RDF data model that we use, um, while it provides very uh, detailed data or can provide very detailed data, um, often that can get in the way particularly if you're not particularly uh, technically adept, because sometimes you just want uh, a nice Excel table with coordinates and keywords, and you're not bothered about the links or the, the nuanced data. And unfortunately at the moment, that's not really something that SOC can provide. If you just want a flat table of data, then you're going to have to download the RDF and uh, manage it yourself locally for the time being. And our open API, while uh, very useful and accessible, uh, was created at a time when the standards for the semantic web and linked data were still evolving. And uh, nowadays, uh, the linked data community has sort of uh, standardized or, or gathered around particular standards which didn't exist back when SOC was created. And the fact that we our platform doesn't support those newer standards sometimes presents a barrier to to greater interoperability with the wider uh, linked data community so as a researcher to get access to this data that we have this uh, treasure that we have in SOC um, there are a few things that you can do these are these are along the more technical side um, so firstly, of course, we have this API that you can search. And if you're a programmer, then there are um, frameworks that you can use to more easily access the API uh, published on, on GitHub uh, with documentation on our website as well. Um, the, the web API itself is fairly straightforward, but if you're using a particular programming language, you might be more comfortable using a framework. You can also um, batch download records from the SOC index. So you can uh, search for a 
maybe a particularly broad uh, search criteria, you might want to find all the bronze objects or all the objects that are uh, from a particular uh, chronological archaeological period, and then batch download those, and then maybe do a, a finer search locally on your own computer. Uh, if you want to do those finer searches, you can uh, then use those records that you've downloaded to query using the standard Sparkle query language for linked data. Um, and uh, as I said before, you can reuse our URIs to um, augment the data, uh, particularly if you're if you're if you're a researcher doing a particular project, you might want to enrich uh, records or um, uh, augment records locally with data that's relevant for your own research purposes using those those shared identifier. Um, speaking now to, to cultural heritage organizations, if you're a, a head of a museum listening to this, then uh, there are a few things that you can do to help to improve the data quality that comes into SOC. Um, one of those is as mentioned before, use existing data standards, apply those existing data standards, um, especially uh, when it comes to um, uh, shared vocabularies, and especially um, in terms of thinking from the start in terms of a, an open world model. So um, when you're considering uh, digital collections management, don't assume that all relevant data will be contained within your database. Uh, build the database in such a way that it um, that it can make reference to and be referenced from external uh, resources. Um, because if you do that, then firstly it will um, facilitate uh, providing data to aggregators like SOC and like Europeana, but also it means that you can gain more out of it by um, not limiting yourself to just things in your collection. And if you combine those two things and allow reference to external authorities, then it means that you can start to apply um, not just uh, a string keyword, but but uh, actual linked data thesauri, such as the Getty AT thesauri, Kulturnov, um, Fish Monuments types thesauri, and, and so forth, which are all available as linked data authorities. Um, and all of this makes it easier then to cross search to make your data machine re more machine readable and more interoperable with other, other data sets. As Nia mentioned, um, a lot of data sets are um, created and are maintained um, primarily uh, within the context of digital collection management. And that's, that's, that, that applies to most of the museum data sets that we see in SOC. Um, so it's important to bear in mind when you're creating and managing digital museum collections that there are applications outside your immediate institutional needs, there are applications outside the target audiences that you tend to think of as museums, particularly in terms of research, that you may not anticipate. And when you're modeling your data and publishing it, it's important to bear that in mind that there may be needs and applications that are beyond the, th the ones that you're immediately thinking about for your systems. I'd just like to wrap up by doing a quick plug for some uh, some in data enhancements that are coming to SOC soon um, within the field of archaeology in particular. So at the National Heritage Board we have uh, a cultural monuments register uh, which is already in the SOC index and that contains information about historic and ancient monuments. We also have finds data from museums and we have photographs from all kinds of institutions but there are some aspects that have hitherto been missing uh, which are now within a project that's currently running, going to be provided into SOC. One of those is data about fieldwork interventions, so excavations and fieldwork, uh, uh, archaeological fieldwork. Um, that data exists now in the Cultural Monuments Register, but uh, it's not been provided into SOC. That's going to come in and be linked then against the monuments that those fieldwork interventions have uh, investigated and also then hopefully allow finds to be linked against the excavations that found them and also the monuments where they were found. Linked to that is then also the fieldwork reports themselves. These also exist but haven't historically been linked uh, to the monuments and fieldwork interventions and with this new data that's going to come in we'll allow those links to exist. <coughs> 
And then finally, we have uh, digitized fieldwork records. So the actual fieldwork data that has been gathered uh, during excavation work. And again, that is going to be published and uh, is going to be harvested into the SOC index, which will allow you to then um, hopefully to browse not just the monuments, but also any uh, excavation and fieldwork data and related finds in a, in a, in a linked data way. <laughs> allowing you to, to navigate through all of these different resources uh, to get the information that you need. Uh, that's about all I have to say for the time being, but I would imagine that there are questions coming. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, that was really good uh, by you and Mia both. So if you stop sharing now, and Mia, if you can turn on your, uh, your video, I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, and I'm just going to activate gallery view. So we have uh, some questions that have come in and uh, please add more questions, everyone, if you have something. And I also have some of my own, but we're going to start uh, a bit with uh, Carlotta Capuru. Uh, thanks you very much for your presentation. And she wonders how, how can an institution benefit from the metadata enrichment from Erpiana when it is correct? Do you have any case studies or examples of that? Well, it will be more findable. It will be easier to find when you enrich it with maybe keywords or colors in a painting or in a photo and so on. Um, and uh, as we told you, we, we are not adding uh, so much metadata uh, to, to, to the records except from these technical metadata. But the, the, we actually add one more thing in SOX mapping to Eripiana. And that is a language tag. Uh, so you can actually detect um, in these free text fields, the uh, uh, records uh, that it is Swedish. And that will um, uh, allow automatic, automatic translation. Um, so that, that is two examples. Do you have uh, anything, Marcus, or should we move on to the next? Um, I think the only thing I would add is that um, I mentioned this round tripping project, which is a project that, that Albin actually did, uh, and that that examines the, the slightly broader question of how, in general, uh, metadata enrichments can be brought back to the, the institutions that manage those records. Um, it's not specific to European, actually, the case study is, is Wikimedia, but the conclusions, I think, are applicable to, to any, uh, any such endeavor. Yeah. Uh, and we now have a question from Kotan Tran, and i sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, we know the benefits of APIs. API mean different ways to share data with other parties. Some experts argue that APIs will become more context-centric and requirement-oriented. What do you think about that? What is the future of APIs in the heritage sector, in your opinion? Is that, is that something you can answer, you think? Uh, that's a very difficult question, and I think making predictions about the future of anything within the heritage sector is just setting oneself up for a disappointment. Um, but I think, um, I think in in general, uh, just because of the proliferation of APIs and the proliferation of different uh, data services, um, my expectation would be that that APIs are going to become more more generic. Actually, that uh, we're going to see um, sort of more standardized APIs around a, a REST interface or a Sparkle interface. Sparkle is the, the sort of the standard API for, for linked data. Um, that, in, that mean that you as a developer don't have to learn something new for each different service that you want to interact with, that you can have some kind of generic layer. Then whether those APIs support um, particular kinds of queries that are specific to the data set in question, that's certainly a possibility. But I think you're going to see a proliferation of more APIs, but in a, a more sort of homogenous way, if that makes sense. Good. Uh, we now have uh, an answer, a uh, question from Magnus Elia. What objects do you link same as Erpiana? Are all those objects in Wikidata? Is there a change stream API for Kulturnav to track new things like that? Uh, so there's a bunch of questions in there. Mm -hmm. I shall try to take them one at a time. Mm -hmm. uh, objects linked same as in Europeana. 
Uh, those same as links between objects in SOC and Europeana exist almost exclusively uh, within the UGC hub. So if you want to get access to those, you should query that API and you'll find them. Uh, are all those objects in Wikidata? No, they are not. But we do have a lot of uh, same as object, same as links to Wikidata. Uh, this time both within SOC, but also again primarily within the, the UGC hub. Uh, and as for a chain stream API for Kultur Nov, uh, I don't work with Kultur Nov, so I can't answer that question. I don't think that there is. I was, yeah, uh, I was thinking a little bit about, uh, and I also, since I know, since I've sp spoken to you before, uh, sometimes when you, like, like and, and as you pointed out, there is a massive difference between the information that is actually in the collection databases then what is sent to onwards to SOC because it has to go through sort of filter and then there's another filter going on to uh, Erpiana. But uh, one of the things that I was wondering about is perhaps putting up sort of a, a, a comparative Craigslist for uh, for cultural heritage institutions say that this is a big bulk of uh, interesting things that we have, digitized photos or artwork that is lacking a lot of metadata. And if someone wants to start a research project, uh, adding data to that, do you think like, how, how do we make, so my question is kind of like, how do we make researchers and cultural heritage institutions find each other more and, 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 and discover each other's needs better? Have you thought anything about that? Not really. Yeah, it is a tricky one. Uh, maybe speed dating. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that could be a really good idea, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, historically, uh, we in the SOC team have, have not really been focusing on researchers and, and universities that much. Uh, but recently, we have started both um, contacting universities as partners, but also like this, uh, trying to reach out to the, the research community. So we are sort of in the in the start of this. So if someone ha has any good ideas, uh, we are more than happy to 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 receive them. Yeah, uh, because maybe we could facilitate something like <laughs> speed dating or presenting ideas or or something. Yeah, that would be quite and for, and for master students as well in a way that could it, it's a quite good way of learning how to deal with uh, both collections and digitization having to uh, work work through this and we can see if we can do something in the autumn um, in that regard. Uh, I was thinking I about say, the, yeah. Like, sorry, if I could just add quickly, there are mm. there are some institutions that sort of sit somewhere between heritage organisations and researchers that may have a role to play here. So one example would be uh, the Swedish National Data Service, yeah. who um, ma maintain and and guarantee access to uh, research data, and often that research data is built upon uh, existing data sets that have been published by either heritage organisations or by by previous researchers. And uh, it's possible that, that organizations like that that sort of straddle the two spheres may have a role to play there, I guess. Yeah, I think sometimes it's all, all that is really needed is someone to can bring two parties together in a room or a digital room or somewhere like that to make them find each other. Uh, and I was also thinking about, you, you mentioned often the, the UGC hub and that you, it can be used for annotating and things like that. Have you thought, about, but have you actually had sort of like a hackathon a focus, like we do, we do have Wikimedia or Wiki uh, hackathon sometimes, but how about a UGC hackathon, sort of aimed at teaching people how to use this? It's, it's not something we've considered, I don't think. Um, it's, the, the, sadly, the, the UGC hub is not really something that we have actively promoted during the, the lifetime of some. Mm. Um, so it's, it's sort of underused in a way. Um, the things that you can add in the UGC hub, just briefly, you can create links between objects in SOC, you can create links out to objects uh, external to SOC, but you can also tag with keywords and you can also uh, provide coordinate data for records that, that lack it. And those two last functions really have not been used at all. It's almost exclusively been used for links so far. 
Yeah, that will be really interesting. Uh, we have a comment here from Johanna. Uh, we probably need resources for a broker service between museums and university researchers. Yes, I completely agree. I know in the UK they ran a project a few years ago with appointed brokers scouting people resources on both sides. Yeah, so the question is, is how to uh, how to manage that here? And and this is also something we want. Uh, we, we see these webinars as a start, and we want people to take away these questions and issues from here and, and we're going to reach out with both surveys and, um, uh, and, and get feedback from you uh, on how to proceed, what would be the most prioritized things, what is needed, uh, what's worth uh, spending any time on. So each of you that uh, is in here, you can add suggestions now, but you can also, you, we will get back to you on this in a bit. How, how do we get people to find each other because that's usually one of the biggest um, uh, um, biggest challenges uh, in a way. Um, but uh, what what is uh, uh, lo looking into the sort of um, the free data? What I really felt felt like with both what you presented and what was presented earlier today by Larissa and Albin and and Hugo is uh, the way that Sometimes I feel like people are, are worried about, they say that we cannot focus on researchers, it's so specialized, they have very specialized needs, and I know that. But one of the things is that maybe you don't really need to make something specifically tailored for researchers, you just have to make sure that it's accessible and open and out there. So, how, but have you gotten sort of, have you had developed any, you've been working with SOC for quite a long time now. Do you feel like there is a greater understanding in, in a wider community now what, what this is useful for? Or is it still very much well, like you're speaking to? <laughs> no, I think it's easier to, to, to speak to the institutions and, and to, to get sort of an understanding, but it's still very, uh, depending on on uh, specific persons uh, on most institutions and and really this is a question about leadership and managing in, in the in the institutions if the if the steering group or, or the the managing board isn't on on, on this there will be, will be nothing really uh, and I think it's also important not only to, to open up your data or resources uh, and, and putting them online, but also describing what you're having. Um, it, it's not, you, you can't just um, expect something to happen just to put it online. Um, so so yeah. it, it, it's much more work than just uh, digitize and put it online and like leaning backwards and think you're ready because then then it's when the hard work starts, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind it of like, also, yeah. You... It does also depend a little bit on how the data is, is published. So as I mentioned, SOC has this, this very rich and expressive data model. Um, but for a lot of researchers, that's not actually what you always want. Um, there's there's a, a good principle, I think, that easy things should be easy to do and difficult things should be possible to do. And with SOC uh, at the moment, um, everything is equally easy or difficult and everything requires the same fairly high level of threshold of uh, technical knowledge. And I think that's an area where we definitely could, uh, do, could use further development to make simple things simpler to do while retaining the ability to do complex things if you want to. Exactly. It's really great. I was wondering, Anna, uh, if you have uh, any reflections and thoughts. Can you can you see me? I have yes. a lot of technical problems, and <laughs> I, I I'm sorry, guys. I don't know what is going on, gals. Uh, I have no idea uh, why. Uh, the one thing I want to say is how important it is that there is cooperation because cooperation between different stakeholders, for example, the European Commission, the Europeana sort of uh, 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 platforms, as well as ours here in Sweden, uh, is extremely important because that means we open up research to more people. And of course, there are complexities that we said before. So for example, what language do we enrich? To, what do we, how do we make sure that these are, things are really open? Uh, but 
the reality is that if we start discussing it and we start collaborating between two different sectors and three different sectors and think of this as as europe meaning that you know european countries between us we are a little bit we're, we, we are loving each other but we also have a few issues between us and i think that getting it's a little bit like a complicated uh, big family <laughs> a star family so i think it's very important to to technically and 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 epistemologically be on the same level so we can interoperate and then really produce excellent research that's all i have to say i'm really grateful for all of this this has been fantastic yes for for us too and uh we want to uh, like I said, we want to continue to work with this and maybe also to organize some smaller uh, sessions where there will be more interaction uh, with, uh, with the participants. Uh, and we will uh, send out a survey uh, to ask for some feedback. And if you don't want to answer the survey and get off the list, it's very easy to do so. Uh, but uh, that is... Uh, I think this is something that will not be fixed in a very short while. Uh, it will take work, but for me personally, uh, I've seen so many things happen. Sometimes we forget the enormous progress that has been made. And it's uh, when you put out the numbers, for instance, Marcus and Mia, with this, all these institutions, all these data, all these objects and things, it's quite amazing actually how much is happening right now. Uh, and I think that also the more is aggregated and collected and made visible, the more people want to be engaged with it and become interested in it. So I think this is something we we are inherited. So we should be able to have a long-term perspective on things. Uh, but at the same time, we can't wait too long because we became we become very dependent on digitized information. I was just wondering as a last sort of question or issue for you, Mia and Marcus, do you have an, an understanding of when you get a digitized collection from a museum, uh, it just represents a, a portion of what is actually available in the collections? Do you have, I, I can imagine the numbers vary quite a lot between different institutions and how much is actually digitized. Definitely. We have one of our recent partners that are sort of, we, we haven't um, harvested the, the data yet, yet, but they said they have over 4 million photos in the collection and maybe they have 1,000 of them digitized and none have right statements. So, so it's like a work in progress really. But we always tell the, the, our partners that you will never be finished just start somewhere and start with the easy stuff, start with the public domain, the really old stuff, um, just to see what happens. Yeah. Yes, and we got a, a comment here from Johanna that some institutions may be reluctant to publish the full data sets uh, researchers tend to ask for and are more familiar with the idea of cure, picking out the best, curating, uh, but uh, they, they pr prefer to make these choices themselves. Uh, and do you think that this has to do with that they're um, that they're nervous about they know that the data is problematic and and uh, less than perfect but it's kind of like a it becomes a catch-22 you can't make it better if you don't share the data and and vice versa so um yeah so that's quite quite an interesting question is but it, it is really scary I, I worked with old data myself and i know how scary it is sharing something that you know that this this has a lot of errors that this has a lot of missing information and it's really putting yourself out there and it's very scary but on the other hand unless you do it nothing is going to happen so that's quite interesting to see if we can but, a few years ago, people, many museums weren't even willing to share images uh, as a CC BY, and, and now we, we have a very different situation. So it, it, there is progress. One thing that's really good, we have now reached um, quite a lot of uh, institutions that have started to share the data. And the institutions that are, are a bit scared or ashamed of their their, their lack of metadata, they can actually see that, well, we are not alone in this. Mm. Even the large institutions have 
some crappy data. <laughs> and I think that is uh, actually encouraging uh, yeah. them to, to let go of, yeah. of it. Yeah, I think that. Show me mine. In. Everybody's data is, is messy or imperfect in some way. Nobody has perfect data, and that should not be a barrier to publishing mm. it. Publish it, publish it, warts and all, and if you need to include caveats and clarifications. But if you if you wait until all of your data is perfect, you'll never publish anything. Yeah. And like I said, uh, that's that's a way for making researchers aware of. Oh, I have something to add here. I have some something I can contribute. I can maybe include this as part of my research project that I will also help you. Uh, improve your data so we can get something out of this, both of us. Uh, it's something I would really like to see more of in the future. But great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone who at, uh, attended and uh, asked question. Oh, let's one more. Uh, Anna Groundwater, hello. Is the usual approach to a cultural institution to share data um, to the data tech people. Oh, it's a usual approach to a cultural institution to share data to the data tech people or collection services or to the researchers within it who may be uh, as or more aware of the research uses for their institution data. So yeah, so how, how, how do they share? Maybe you don't quite know that answer yourselves. How the cultural institutions, who they want to share the data with and uh, uh, who is aware of research users uh, for their data? It's not really um, like the, the people working with, with researchers on the institutions, but we actually, yes, it, it sounds crazy, but we, we, we sort of recently found out that the people we, we are in contact with are mostly the people working in this, uh, managing, managing the systems or the collections. Um, and we, when we're starting to talk about outreach with them, they're sort of, well, 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 oh, we're working with it, but it's not really them, them themselves that works with it. So we are planning to, to have a meeting with, with actually the communicators and, and outreach people at the institutions in the autumn just to discuss how we're going to meet new audiences. Uh, and maybe this is something similar that talking about reaching the community of researchers and students, maybe we should talk to other people at the institutions um, and collaborate more. Yeah, that's a good point because museums and or cultural institutions, they are not an homogenous uh, like anyone else. They have different specialities and sometimes it's uh, there is a, a variation in what kind of communication is internally as well. Uh, sometimes you, all you need is this really important key figure uh, who can, uh, it's the right person in the right place. So yeah, so a uh, comment from Johanna here also. My experience is that institutions are both ashamed, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, are ashamed of lacking data quality and oddly proud in an exclusive manning, making them withhold their precious data in fear of it not being understood by people on the outside. And yeah, I can, I can uh, remember that myself, is that you, you are aware of all the issues and problems and maybe you feel like uh, we, there is uh, no one on, on the outside can really understand this. Um, but I think it's uh, in a way of uh, like selling people short uh, the, and we usually work in, within the same area anyway. Um, so it's and usually like what, what's the worst thing that could happen is something that you can ask and I really like that with the uh, museum uh, director I, that had a presentation one they said that we have started to say yes to everything and then we'll see if it works or not because it's sometimes that's a good way. Uh, So good to include researchers and the database developers uh, in, in all of this. So uh, we have to stop here now uh, and hope you have a good week and we'll get back to you with more information about when this will be uh, made available as recording and also uh, extra uh, reading material and things like that and how to how we will progress in the autumn and thank you very much
for attending everyone and I hope you have a great summer. Goodbye.